it's a real honor to be here representing the city and county of San Francisco, uh, the planning department. Um, my name is Robin. I'm an urban designer and landscape architect um, in the city design group, which is the part of the planning department within which this experimental program emerged and um, continues to operate and make change in San Francisco. So today I'm going to talk uh, just a, a little bit about the program, um, our missions, our goals, how the program emerged. Um, we'll do a little overview of the types of projects that Pavement to Parks delivers to communities. Um, we'll look at how this work has been adapted or um, readapted in, in other places and what we're learning from other cities as they um, also deploy and use these strategies to solve problems in their own communities. And then I'll close up with a little bit about how we are monitoring and evaluating these experimental places. So Pavement to Parks really began recognizing that a uh, quarter to a third of the land area of San Francisco is made up of our street grid of right of way. And so that's obviously huge opportunity, a huge venue for making change, for impacting the way that we experience our everyday lives. San Francisco is a walk first and bike first city, so this program sits really squarely within our city policy. There are, are a few um, documents here on the, or excuse me, a couple documents here on the screen which refer explicitly to the types of operations that Pavement to Parks engages in. Parklets, which is m what we're going to mostly talk about, really, um, in my mind, come from San Francisco. They have their origins in um, avant-garde performance art and installation art, really that goes back to the 1970s. There was an installation artist named Bonnie Ora Shirk, who, with a grant from the Museum of, um, of Modern Art, installed these parks, essentially, in the middle of highways and highway off-ramps and little alleys throughout the city, using the material vocabulary of sort of the countryside and the farmyard to really critique and um, bring our attention to the spatial imbalance that the auto-centric development and uh, reconfiguration of San Francisco streets uh, caused in the mid-century. Looking a little bit later to uh, the mid-2000s, we had the first Parking Day, which is a, a one-day worldwide celebration, which I know that Adelaide is an avid participant of. And so that's sort of um, you know, the next step in um, the next antecedent, I guess you could say, to um, parklets, which we'll see in just a moment. Our work is predicated on this idea that um, you, know, you do something small, you do something acupunctural, you do something for a moment, and it really provides the opportunity for citizens and, and uh, policymakers to start reimagining what our streets can and should be doing. So this is a little phrase that we've stolen from Mike Leiden at the Streets, Street Plans Collaborative, who um, has written a series of of uh, volumes, authored a series of volumes called T Tactical Urbanism. There was a book that, that recently came out this year. So getting a little bit closer to what it is that we actually do, what actually happens out in space, um, we, we look at sort of two sets of criteria in, in trying to understand whether or not Pavement to Parks as the City program should come in and help with facilitation. First and foremost, we um, uh, try and assess a potential site, and these uh, sites are, are typically identified by members of the community. They could be um, a community benefit district or maybe just in, a resident, a property owner, a business uh, operator in a certain neighborhood. We look at the site's potential to enhance pedestrian safety. Um, pedestrian fatalities from auto collisions are um, an epidemic in San Francisco and in American cities. and. Pavement to Parks is really closely aligned with changing those pedestrian conditions and signaling the, the presence of a pedestrian to motorists in the city. We're also really keen to make sure that our work helps to uh, increase access to open space. Parks and, and open spaces are not evenly distributed throughout the city, throughout any city really. Um, there are many neighborhoods which have fewer, smaller parks and playgrounds. And so this is a really critical strategy for um, helping to, um, to, to rebalance um, people's access to uh, parks and playgrounds. 
We also, of course, look at uh, where there's opportunities to introduce greening and um, help to push the biodiversity, the urban biodiversity um, agenda that our city has. The other half to trying to figure out whether or not um, we should be operating in a certain neighborhood or a certain community is whether or not there's actually strong local support for us to, I don't know, close down a street to traffic or steal some parking, appropriate or occupy, occupy some parking, depending on who you're talking to. Um, that has to be an idea that is, is really something that this, um, the community of businesses on this high street want to see happen. So that's something we examine very closely and we have pretty high thresholds for uh, project proponents satisfying and demonstrating that that uh, community support is present. We work with all different types of organizations and project sponsors on parklets and pedestrian plazas and prototypes. Here's just a, a quick list of everyone who we work with. Um, and so just to you know, reflect back, broadly speaking, um, our program is in place to um, sort of galvanize communities, um, to strengthen and build the social fabric around public space in these neighborhoods. Um, these projects often provide um, a, a rallying point, a conversation um, point for communities to talk about and, and to work together on something. Um, we, of course, want to help people reimagine what our streets and sidewalks can be doing. We have very, very narrow sidewalks, very, very wide streets, lots and lots of parking in San Francisco, and it's critical for us to really rebalance that distribution of space in our streets. So our, our projects help uh, people to, to envision that. Of course, we want to make sure that we're hitting city goals to enhance pedestrian safety. Um, and then there's also an, an economic development piece of this as well. And so we really use this strategy as part of our area level planning, as part of um, all of the work that we do at all levels and scales of, of planning throughout the city. Okay, so what, do, what is it that we're actually talking about? What are these projects? What do they look like? What do they feel like? How do they um, impact and improve the experience of pedestrians and shoppers and people running errands, people who live and work in our neighborhoods? There are three general, generally speaking, there are three types of projects that we help to facilitate. Um, the, the largest of these interventions we call pedestrian plazas, and um, you know, this isn't a new strategy. We see uh, New York and Chicago and Los Angeles looking at their roadways and, and trying to reclaim redundant uh, pieces of that roadway and convert it back to pedestrian use. We have also innovated this um, strategy called the parklet, which is where we, where we take two or three of those parking spaces where maybe one or two uh, people are storing their car for hours and hours and hours on end and putting two dozen, three dozen human beings in that space um, for that length of time. And then we're also experimenting with how art and technology can come together to find expression and, um, and uh, to find expression and to sort of flirt and play with um, how public space can be influenced by um, sort of art and technology coming together. So that's our prototyping program. We've got about seven of these plazas over the, over the past five years installed on the ground. Um, Pavement to Parks kicked off, initiated about five years ago in 2009 with, with two plazas and two parklets. Um, and you know, these have been overwhelmingly popular. We have a list, a um, dozen communities long, of neighborhoods that really want this kind of action and this kind of change happening in their neighborhoods. It's purely just a question of capacity on the city's part to make all those dreams come true. Um, in five years, we've installed over 50 parklets. We're hedging up on 60 with um, an annual RFP, um, growing that number more and more. And there are also these various prototypes. We'll look at a few examples of these in a second. And so here you can see that most of the work so far that Pavement to Parks has done is concentrated in the central and northwest parts of San Francisco. Um, our central business district, our, our financial district, is in that northwest corner there along the waterfront here. So, and then many, many of our outer western and southern neighborhoods are, are much more suburban in character. Um, but 
also, they're the, uh, they're the parts of the city that are the least served by uh, public open space. Folks have lots of front yards and backyards, but there are a few places for neighbors to actually get together and, and be one another and socialize um, outside. We've run a number of design competitions over the last couple years um, to try and get industrial designers and tech developers and um, people in the art community to just explore how we can create objects, not just for creating the object's sake, but to um, solve specific problems. There's not a lot of space in San Francisco for um, sidewalk bicycle storage or bicycle parking. Our sidewalks are very narrow. Many of our um, curbside travel lanes are, are available for parking during the daytime, but then must, they've got to be vacated um, for peak uh, travel during the evenings. So in, situ in situations where we have, say, events and conventions and um, other festivals, there's, uh, real, there's no place for anyone to park their bike. So we hosted an international design competition to um, create a, a portable bicycle corral that could be collapsed quickly and moved um, into storage um, by one or two people and then and put out during these high um, demand periods. So uh, this was actually designed by students at uh, the Academy of Art. Some fun pictures there. We're looking at how uh, cultural institutions and entertainment uh, performance, art and music um, organizations can um, bring their programs and their missions out into the public realm. This was uh, an intervention similar to a parklet. It, it collapses and can be um, just sort of pop up anywhere. Um, we also looked at uh, a parklet that roves around a roves around the high street. Every six months it moves around. It was first hosted by um, a frozen yogurt place, so very popular, and then um, is currently being hosted by the library, the, the neighborhood library in this, in this part of town. Um, Parklets are uh, something which I love to talk about and I think most people are probably familiar with. Um, you know, these are San Francisco's um, attempt to bring publicly accessible open space to our neighborhoods. And um, th this, or this idea and this strategy originated in San Francisco and um, they remain a way for us to provide public open space. Many of our parklets are hosted by cafes and restaurants, um, and there are some strict regulation, uh, operating guidelines around how those um, eateries um, interact with their parklets, um, because we want to emphasize that these places are for everyone to use and not just patrons of one particular business. We've got bicycle shops, again, cafes hosting parklets, we have an art gallery which um, hosts this parklet. It, it changes every six to eight months. They have a new artist in residence. Uh, it's, most recently it was a sculptor. The last one was um, a painter. He was a muralist who built a different parklet every eight months. This is absolutely one of my favorite sites ever. Um, strangely enough, we don't have a picture of the kids crawling all over this thing, but this is typically just you know toddler heaven. Um, and you know, physically, spatially speaking, the, the parklet is a really adaptable typology. So you can see it you know, be deployed in all kinds of situations, like here out by uh, Ocean Beach and some diagonal parking. Um, we've had parklets sponsored by residents. This, uh, there's, a, there's a bicycle activist named Deep Jawa in San Francisco. He's on our bicycle coalition board. And um, he put this parklet in front of his residential driveway to make a statement about um, public space and um, walking and biking. He also got married in his parklet, which I don't, I don't know if we have a picture of that coming up. I think we do. So it was a big Indian wedding in, in one of our parklets. It was pretty beautiful. Uh, this, this typology is also, as I said, it's really malleable. So we've seen it um, here at, at the Powell Street Promenade, which is uh, the most heavily pedestrian um, <coughs> dense part of San Francisco. It's, it's right in the center of sort of our, the, the heart of our tourist district. This parklet uh, spans for two whole blocks on both sides of the street. It was designed by Walter Hood at UC Berkeley's School of Environmental Design. Um, the Swiss Cultural Annex recently sponsored a parklet and so they have movie screenings and lectures and performances and all kinds of other events here at their site in North Beach. This 
becomes a movie screen, so they screen, um, you know, Ingrid Bergman on here during the festival. Uh, we also recently had a, a parklet designed by high school students working with the Exploratorium, which is a, a, a tech and science kids museum in San Francisco. So this is actually um, the, the Ciencia Publica parklet, um, which this year focuses on water. So, you know, there's, there's uh, sort of the, the history and, and geopolitics of water in, in California are really complex and it's part of our narrative as a historical narrative as a state and so this, uh, installation has these really wonderful um, interactive um, components to it. You wind the thing and the water gets pumped from the aqueduct and waters all of the little pots of herbs. And so this is, um, has been really, really fun to see parklets move from places where you, know, you might grab a latte and sit outside your favorite cafe to really moving into other territory with us working with art and science museums and other types of institutions who again, are, are bringing their mission and their work out into public space. Um, the Museum of Craft and Design is um, in the process of building their parklet in um, one of the post-industrial parts of town, um, an area of the city that's really starting to turn rapidly um, in terms of development and adaptive reuse of a lot of our historic warehouses. Um, so this is really gonna be a game changer in, ter in terms of how this part of the city looks and feels. Um, it's gonna feel a lot safer with these large um, light standards which will provide pedestrian lighting at night and then also will project uh, light art onto the warehouse. Um, the, the Museum of Craft and Design is in this old huge warehouse with a, with a huge blank wall that addresses the neighborhood. So they saw this as an opportunity as a canvas for um, for, for bringing light art out into the neighborhood. There are these pedestrian plazas which I've talked about. Um, you know, we have a very sort of straightforward way for delivering these to communities that involve not just sort of us at planning, but also our municipal transportation agency as well as our Department of Public Works, um, all working together to put these on the ground. And, um, this is just a quick slide explaining who does what um, in this process. Uh, this is one great example that we love to talk about. This is um, what will be known as Jane Warner Plaza in the Castro District, of San Francisco. So a really highly visited neighborhood, um, you know, a national and international sort of tourist destination, really. We've got our historic streetcar terminating in this neighborhood before it heads up Market Street back out into the, the um, financial district. And you can see here it's a large intersection, you know, just expanses of asphalt, ambiguous for cyclists and pedestrians and motorists and the streetcar. It's very, very, you know, sort of illegible how you, how you walk through this space safely. And so um, after a few trials, we um, reconfigured the, this intersection and closed much of it to traffic so that we had this. And um, this is now the, the, the heart of the Castro District. This is, this is our plaza. And um, you can see how we, we went through several different iterations. There was a, 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 a shorter three month sort of testing period where we looked at things like um, you know, geometry and turning radii and just tried to understand, okay, where were we gonna draw the lines on the ground? What were we gonna actually close? What needed to remain open uh, for the streetcar right of way, its dynamic envelope, et cetera. After we went through that three month testing period, we then um, revisited the site and installed um, new fixtures uh, that had a little bit more permanence in terms of their materiality and engineering. And then most recently, this, this pocket, this plaza, you can see how the streetcar turns around through here, was folded into um, the larger um, capital plan for, for massive streetscape redesign that um, was implemented in this neighborhood. So this is a really successful example of how Pavement to Parks likes to operate, where we start small, we work for a few months, and we influence the long-term outcome um, of public space in a neighborhood. Another similar example here at Persia Triangle and the Excelsior, this is one of our outer neighborhoods. It's one of the neighborhoods where we have um, the most diversity in terms of um, our ethnic populations and languages spoken. 
It's one of the neighborhoods that has the highest number of young people resident in the neighborhood. Um, and um, this is the place that in our community and public outreach, everyone identified as the heart of their neighborhood. This car park and huge uh, you know, intersection, there are several bus lines which intersect here. This is a transit node. But as we can see, utterly abysmal for um, pedestrians, um, our senior citizens, our young citizens who um, walk through this part of the neighborhood daily. So uh, through some community outreach, we did some, some you know, conceptual rendering, some envisioning of things that uh, neighbors had expressed they'd like to see. They wanted a pedestrian refuge. They wanted an expanded sidewalk so that they could actually stop and gather and talk with one another. They wanted public art. They wanted food trucks. They wanted um, you know, a better marked crosswalk. So we just threw everything in there. Um, here's, a, here's a plan view. Um, so you can imagine if, if sort of none of this existed, um, really how unfriendly it is to the pedestrian. Um, this project, again, influenced long-term uh, infrastructure plans for um, pedestrian safety improvements in the neighborhood. We just ended up installing this bit as part of the temporary phase, but in working with the Municipal Transportation Agency, we were able to identify several other places in the vicinity of Persia Triangle where um, you know, it was really critical to put in permanent pedestrian refuges. We had a, a sort of a one-day open streets event where we just brought out some paint and some chalk and some pots and got neighbors really, really excited about what Persia Triangle could look like and what it should look like. And um, just about a year later, after we had done some, some more detailed design, <coughs> neighbors came together again to actually participate in installation, to participate in planting and painting. Um, it's our district supervisor there, our elected official. And uh, the, the work continues on site. There are many other pieces which the community had decided that they wanted, so they recruited other architects and other artists to come join the conversation and um, contribute continually to different um, infrastructure at this place. This is the last case study that I'll talk about. This is Annie Adley Plaza. Um, really similar conditions actually to the CBD here in Adelaide. Um, I think our CBD and your CB CBD might be a very similar vintage with the gold rush and everything. Um, this was just an alley, you know, in South of Market, but it was one of the critical pedestrian linkages between Market Street, which is sort of the, the main spine of our city, and Mission Street, which is where many cultural institutions and museums and um, other, other institutions are sort of located, centered around. And so we took that space and we just closed it to traffic and we introduced some very simple um, elements to um, provide opportunities for seating. Here you can see that um, there's public programming that happens, free public programming that happens in this space um, three times a week. These are our belly dancers who are really, really popular. Um, you know, there are movie screenings and daytime picnics and um, lots of things that uh, happen in this alley that are, are really um, honoring the residents and worker population's need for a place to gather. There aren't any parks or, or public spaces in this part of town to speak of, so borrowing this little bit of alleyway has um, really made a huge difference, and um, we can't people get people to, to leave. I mean, they're, they're there all times of day or night. Um, here you can see Annie as uh, one of the alleys throughout the district that have been identified for um, experimentation uh, closure. And so um, now that we're done with Annie, I've got to get to work on all of this other stuff. It's going to be fun. So again, there's, just, uh, there's ongoing programming that happens at, at Annie um, three times a week, everything from fitness classes to lectures to movie nights to um, events for youth. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I actually brought copies of this, but I, I forgot to put them out. Um, San Francisco recently issued the second edition of its Parklet Manual, which is downloadable from our website, and there'll be a couple hard copies floating around the conference for the next day and a half. 
Um, this has been a really fun project to take this open space experiment um, that really was very much inspired by Parking Day and, um, and try to figure out how to provide some you know, really solid guidance, design and engineering guidance um, for our public so that um, they could go ahead and produce more of these things. And uh, this is one of the infographics that came out of this edition of the Parklet Manual. And it's been really fun because we get to talk to cities all over the world about their budding Parklet programs. And they put out their infographics. This is Sao Paulo, Brazil, came out uh, last year. Um, and so it, it's been really wonderful to see how this typology has been sort of exported and adapted all over the world. Um, it's also been codified within um, our street, uh, Urban Street Design Guide, which is a national uh, guidance document for complete streets in the states. Um, and then, yes, just an overview of everywhere we've tracked a parklet being installed um, around the world. And we've, we've spoken to many of these people um, over the course of the last five years um, as they've set up their new programs. And we continue to talk to them to exchange lessons learned and successes and challenges um, operating in this very you know, sometimes contentious territory. Of course, Adelaide's right at the top. Uh, everyone talks about Splash Adelaide back home, so um, everyone was really jealous when I got to come out here to represent the city. And then, just quickly to wrap up, there's a lot of material, so I'm going really quickly. Um, we initiated a research lab out of Pavement to Parks a couple years ago um, when I came on to manage the Parklet program. And um, that was really for us to be able to start systematically monitoring and evaluating the success of these very often different looking um, interventions. So um, w one of the things we did right away was get really serious and geospatial about um, how we were going to um, be more deliberate and sophisticated about where we operate and where we work. So we had a fantastic research fellow who came, um, and we worked together to develop um, this, this, um, this GIS network analysis to try and understand, OK, where are the streets that are um, more than five minutes walk from any park or playground, number one. Number two, um, aren't on uh, streets that have a, have a slope or street grade over 5%. So you know those streets where, um, which would be most accessible to most of our, our population, disabled or, or senior or otherwise, and are relatively close to or within um, a high street or a c commercial district. And so we came up with this map, which is now um, the main armature for how we screen proposals as they come into the program. Um, we also have developed instruments and in reporting uh, for uh, observing and evaluating our parklets and our plazas. Um, we had another research fellow in last summer who I worked with to um, do a citywide assessment, of, citywide assessment of parklets and plazas, looking at activities. Um, you know, this is all very sort of standard William White, uh, Jan Gale type stuff. Um, but really um, synthesizing a, a, an evaluation methodology that we could apply specifically to these small places. Um, we do both passive and, and active sort of observational intercept surveys. There's, there's a, a number of different ways that we collect data about our sites and the users of our sites. Um, so here's some just quick examples of these instruments, which are all administered on paper with clipboards. Um, which is very laborious in terms of data entry and analysis, and, and there's geocoding, and there's all of this stuff that needs to happen. So um, our research fellow, um, our most recent research fellow, came in and um, looked into uh, how we could use tablets <coughs> and mobile phones, smartphones, to collect all of that data that we would otherwise collect with those pieces of paper, and really just cut many steps out of the process. Um, there is a little white paper and an instruction manual that Gene developed, um, which is also downloadable from our website in case anybody's interested in um, you know, figuring out how to use your mobile phone to collect data and do monitoring at your sites. This is so fantastic because you can collect the data right on your tablet, and then it beams it to the cloud. And then you know, your analyst back at the office can just pop open GIS and um, start doing analysis. So um, we're really excited with a population of 50 parklets and 
10 or so plazas and even more um, coming up throughout the city, being able to centralize all of our, um, our, our monitoring data in one place and create more powerful analysis of um, how our, our um, projects are being perceived, um, how they're performing, generally how successful they are. So I didn't want to keep us from a bike ride. That's why I spoke you know, a million miles a minute. But thank you for having me here. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the team that I work with. There are a lot of talented people um, who are behind this work. And it's, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be coordinating that, this program for San Francisco. So 